Hi, um, yes, thanks for giving me the chance to talk 10 minutes basically about um, my findings in the new political world um, about AI, the political system, and basically the way how Germany can be or hopefully can find its way in the race. So basically, um, when you change from the, let's say, the IT world into the political world, it somehow feels really like changing worlds. And I'm as well not living in Berlin, so not like a Berlin Mitte guy, not an urban hipster, so I prefer to live in Rheinland-Pfalz at the German Wine Street, so more the relaxed region. And so it's really like three worlds. So back home, people work in supermarkets, bakeries, whatever, so they don't get the Silicon Valley turtleneck disruption stuff. So, but they also don't get Berlin politics. Politics. And I moved into Berlin politics, becoming a federal politician, and I found out that basically they don't understand tech. So all these worlds are somehow drifting apart. And I found myself to more or less be the translator in that world. Because if we really want to be successful in general, and we somehow didn't really, really were too successful in digitalization, and we wanted to be in the next wave with AI, we should better put these worlds together. And to make it basically visual, why some political discussions or some political laws might not make sense to us, it depends whom they have in mind. So we are definitely um, the digital natives, or at least the digital immigrants. And there are the others. So the stuff we discuss might not be the stuff which classical politicians might have in mind. So this doesn't mean that they don't want to do better regulation. It's just not normal to them, or it's just not their daily business. And if you do classical, or you did classical industry politics all your life, my finding is it's a difference to doing digital politics. Because before, politicians or a state could avoid things to happen. If they don't want a bridge to be built, it's not going to happen. If they don't run a road there, it's not going to happen. You can hate Airbnb and Uber as much as you want. It's going to happen because the people demand them. The people want to have them. And that's a big change in the game. So and if we are honest in Germany, we love patents and we love all that stuff. The only valid patent and the only valid currency is speed. So that's the only thing which really, really saves you, to be honest, at the moment. And speed is unfortunately not a classical political attribute, and sometimes as well not a German attribute. And this is why we are somehow on a new playground. And this is why some decisions and some discussions look cumbersome, even to me now being a part in that area. And I just want to change some, um, I just want to tell you some things which I think would give us a chance to speed up. And in the end, I'm more or less fighting for it in Parliament, and basically try to find people to join. So. I think if we really, really want to speed up, and you can put it in three groups, that's basically the surroundings or the ecosystem. We have to talk about finance, and we have to talk about commitment. So first thing, I think we need English as a second administrative language. So if you are a badass data scientist studied in Stanford, there is the war for talent, the whole world wants to have you. Why would you start to learn German another three years just to be able to fill in your text form at the end of the year? So this is absolutely not what you wanted to do, but it has to be possible to live everywhere in Germany. And we are in Berlin, obviously we do this in English, that's fine, super, I like it. I don't live in Berlin, but I want to have the data scientists or whatever to live in Rheinland-Pfalz as well. And we were always strong as a country because we were decentralized. So if we would be a central country like France, all the problems basically would come with it. So I hope or I fight for it that we can keep somehow our decentralization and get the smart people also to whatever, Ingolstadt, Wolfsburg, you name it, where our hotspots are. The next thing, the finance part. So we all know that there is not enough capital in the market and the state still sits on tons of capital. So why is it not possible to invest basically in the next generation or into the brains of our funders instead of concrete and state bonds? So there are other countries who are a bit more brave basically taking whatever um, pension reserves or pension plans to spend it at least to a certain amount into basically the next generation to help them. And this is also a sign. You know, if the state does that, it might make sense. And the lower left side, true story, my mom was reading newspapers and stuff about AI, and she asked me, Mario, I've got 5K. How can I invest in AI? So 
fair question, whatever, build your own crypto for, go ahead, mom. So that's, why is it not possible to, to do that stuff? People are interested in it. So why does the state don't give any tax credits or whatever to do that sort of investment instead of whatever, restaring, you could futuring or something. So we have to be more brave to make it normal for the people to invest. In one of the speeches at the moment, one guy said somebody has to start the wheel. And this is true. So the money is there, unfortunately. Now we even have more than money, we have three silos. We have startups with ideas, but without cash. We have the middle stand with full order books, but they don't know the future. And we still have family offices like the, the Quants and the Schwartz with lots of money who don't get money on the bank. How wonderful would the world be if these three would interact? And that's, in my opinion, a task of the state to at least facilitate that. So I'm liberal, I don't think that the state can do anything better than basically normal people can do, but at least it's a job to facilitate that. And this brings me to the last part, which is commitment. So uh, right to use technology, it's not meant like in a written law, but we have to be more ambitious. Who of you knows 23andMe, the company, for example? So some of you do. Basically, I can send them my genome, so they read my genome and they send me back my ancestry report and a health report. But I'm in Germany, I wouldn't get the health report because the European Union actually even protects me. So this doesn't make any sense. If I'm aware of what I want to do, if I want to use a technology, why does somebody overprotect me? And now I'm only basically a user who is annoyed but you could never have started 23andMe over here if you're not legally allowed to give back a product. So, and this is true for many more things when it comes to data. And for many more things we will see in the scope of AI and neural networks, deep learning. So if we are that scared and if we only bring data protection up as a blocker, it's not going to work. And I'm not saying that it's not important to do it, but we should not use it as an excuse. And politics in general could be more brave. And being brave is not enough. It should be visionary as well. So I just put it the example of a brain upload because I really, really like that idea and we are not that far. But politics should give a positive utopia. So if we don't do it, then we rather copy a utopia from somebody else, but it might not be ours. The American utopia might be different or we might end up in a dystopia. And talking about a brain upload, why not? How cool would it be sitting there Sunday on a couch getting coffee and downloading the brain of Barack Obama and reliving his life. It's probably better than going to a museum, staring at a muck which he might have used on a Thursday morning and try to imagine how it would be. So, and these are things I think politicians should be willing to tell, just to tell people there is more and just as an appetizer. Not that it's there, but if you believe in such a story and you have the chance to invest in brain-computer interfaces, for example, you might do it. If you think about the cyborg stuff, you might not do it. And these are the stories politicians should start to tell and should basically start to listen. Because I really think something is different right now with AI. True life example, I studied computer science for quite a while. I, I loved the lifestyle of a student, traveled around, so I didn't really have uh, somehow rush or hurry. And my mom actually never asked me, like, how is your Java class or how was your whatever with algorithms. Since I'm in the committee for AI, every time I pick up my kids, I have to talk about AI. Because she wants to talk, people want to talk. Obviously, you're sitting here listening to a politician. Before I was sitting there listening to you, this makes a difference, that's not normal. So basically, that's the momentum where people want to join. So, and coming back to the guy this morning, somebody has to start the wheel. And I think there's really, really a big momentum for us as politicians to do it, and as well for industry, if we all tell the stories quite often. And last slide, basically, I know that political decisions are somehow not easy to understand, but I basically just want to hold a little mirror in front of you. Not even 1% in Germany is politically active. So if you work in HR, you know how big the talent pool is in that case. So if only 1% does the decisions for all of us, and next time you're basically angry at a decision or at a statement from a politician, then sign up for a party, a movement, whatever, but articulate yourself. So it doesn't work out if 99% just say that's not how it worked and I want it a different way. So think about maybe joining that system. I never intended to be a federal politician. Now I'm standing here, I had 
10 minutes to talk to you, 10 seconds left, I'm perfect in time. So thanks for listening, uh, happy to join the discussion afterwards. If you want to send me a message, a tweet, whatever, um, I'm in any social network you can have. I'm the monkey, unfortunately, from um, the speech before. Uh, thanks for listening, that's it. <laughs>